Now in part two of this two-part video, we look at what the underperformance of supercomputing progress means for all of technology and therefore all of the economy. This is a chart I have displayed many times on this channel because it really is that important and the supercomputing data has been updated for the most recent reading that we saw in part one. I believe this trend line to be the far more accurate trend line than the one that was on the top500.org website that was validating this underperformance. I believe validating this underperformance is wrong. It is effectively a soft bigotry of low expectations, so to speak. And when you have the trend line that was in fact being adhered to quite well until 2013, until we see this distinct detour into a lower trajectory, then we get to the bottom of where we are technologically and what the alternate future would have looked like had we been able to stay on this trend line. As you can see, we are almost 100x below where the trend line would have us be at right now in the first half of 2023. Each section here is a 10x gain in computing power and we are almost 100x behind. Now obviously we cannot revert back in a single day, so to intercept this trend line, let's say in two years, we would have to gain 1000x in the next two to two and a half years to intercept this trend line by 2025. That would be a massive, massive technological disruption that appends many aspects of the entire technology sector and the entire economy. But I do think something like that will happen within this decade because otherwise these two lines get too far apart. This is also very related to the connection between technological deflation and money printing that I speak about in many other videos because the amount of money printing that could be ingested and converted into new technology would be much higher if computing were at this trend line. And a large amount of money printing could actually shake loose the pent up forces and move us back towards this trend line too because the greater this divergence and the area enclosed by this wedge here is indicative of the amount of cumulative pressure building up to revert us back to the trend line. The reason we have not reverted back to this trend line yet is because a new paradigm of computing is needed, a new architecture other than the CMOS based chips that we rely on for Moore's law. Many other paradigms of computing new technologies have been in the media over the last 20 years. There were three different carbon-based solutions. They were Buckminster Fullerene or Buckyballs, carbon nanotubes, and graphene. There was also DNA computing in the early 2010s. And around 2016 or so, we started to hear about quantum computing. But even that has faded away. Because if quantum computing was going to happen, then by now there would already be a company with a market cap of $500 billion simply based on its quantum computing technology. But that has also faded away just like the other technologies before it. So we don't know what the successor technology is going to be. All of those remain candidates. One of those might shake loose. And there are a few others as well that I won't mention over here. But one of those or some combination thereof will revert us back to this computing trend line that gets us to where we were meant to be. The opportunity cost of being behind can be observed in many ways. Many of the most well-known futurists in the world, Ray Kurzweil included, they made a bunch of predictions around 2000 for the 2020s, even the early 2020s, which we are in right now. Almost none of those predictions have come true, but all of them appear to be behind by the same amount, by about seven or eight years. If they're all behind by the same amount, then that reveals that there is an underpinning that is common to all of them, and the saturation of the old computing paradigm evident over here is the reason for that. And and every other type of technology flows downstream from this. Energy efficiency gains, storage gains, computers for consumer use, home electronics, and even low-tech products. Some people who want to dismiss everything about futurism say something ignorant like, well, people can't eat computers, therefore computing progress doesn't matter. So do such people actually think that food production does not have any information technology component? That's not true either. I have discussed that in detail in other videos on this channel. And as we progress in this computing paradigm, more and more of the economy gets fused into high tech. In 2022, I estimated that 3% of the world economy was entirely high tech. And I described that in this video up here. Now in 2023, the number is a little bit higher than that. We could be at 4% within two or three more years. Then the implications of computing power progression become greater and greater because it's not merely the exaflops on this chart over here, 
but the percentage of the economy fused into that level of computational progress. And therefore, the economic feedback cycle flows from there. If computing were at the trend line rather than where we are right now, the stock market could easily be twice as high as it is now. Everyone's salary would be quite a bit higher than it is now, even though most of the things you purchase would be the same price or lower. All electronic devices would be much cheaper than they are now, and most commodities would also be cheaper than they are now. That includes food type commodities such as coffee, corn, etc., as well as energy commodities such as oil and natural gas. The economy would simply be more into the future and all of the trends we're already seeing would be several years ahead and thus much more prosperity would be evident. World poverty would be maybe half of what it is now. It's already fallen a lot in the last 50 to 70 years as I describe in this video up here but the last 10% of the people in the world who still live in utter destitution, even that number could have been cut in half if computing were simply over here by now rather than over here. So these are the reasons that this is just about the most important subject in futurism because every substantial subject within the entire field of futurism in some form or the other intersects with computational progress. Whether you're talking about storage, whether you're talking about economic progress or anything else, there's almost nothing about futurism that is not somehow connected to this. Any talk of the technological singularity is governed by this. Even the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is very, very tied to computational progress. In fact, if computational power were closer to this trend line, we would have 10 to 20 times more exoplanets under registry than we have now, and our discovery of any extraterrestrial intelligence or verification that there is no extraterrestrial intelligence either way would be several years further along. I described that in this video up here. So this is the state of supercomputing, which is in fact the apex of all technological progress from which every other technological innovation flows from. And this is one of the most advanced topics for all of us to ponder. Now, if you like this type of content, I encourage you to subscribe to this channel. Thank you very much for watching.